Good evening, or as my friend Ronnie in Jerusalem says, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, Wednesday night class. Uh, Rabbi Jacobson had to be away, so he uh, asked me to come and uh, give a little talk tonight on the, the subject of the times. So I, I welcome everybody. For those, for those we haven't met before, my name is Philip Namenworth. And for those who we have met before, my name is Philip Namanworth. And uh, I've been a student of the rabbis for 25 years, and I, I give classes, and uh, been consulting with people, and I'm a, my profession is I'm a musician, I'm a songwriter. And uh, so I hope that will um, give this class a little bit of an extra slant. Just got back from uh, Israel. Sounds like it's going to be stand up, right? Just get back from Israel. And uh, when I was there, um, I stayed with a very good friend of mine who's a, a student of Rabbi Jacobson's uh, anyway, and we spent a bunch of time together. And then he was very successful in the music business. And uh, so when I got back, I, I asked him a question about something with uh, marketing music. And uh, he gave me a really wonderful answer, and it was very, very different than what I had in my own mind and how I was proceeding. And I said to him, that is so concise, that is so um, right on target, it sees the picture clearly, and uh, regardless of my subjectivity, it, it gives uh, a very profound answer. And he said to me, if only my Torah knowledge could be the same thing. So I said, well, on whatever level, um, learning of any type it can reach is the object is for it to reach a certain point inside you. So no matter what you apply it to, you have a certain conciseness, a certain clarity of vision. Doesn't mean your emotions are out of the way, but you have a certain clarity of vision. And he said, "Well, you know, I was studying with this uh, rabbi there, and he, after the class, I commented on him and I complimented him. He said, "Yeah, but I've been just please, I didn't get this overnight. I've been studying my whole life for this, and." Uh, I said, well, you know, Ronnie, it's not given to everybody to study uh, all night in order to make a difference in their life. Otherwise, we'd all have to uh, stop everything else we're doing. And uh, as it says in the Talmud, many tried the ways of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, whose sole profession was study and Torah, and were not successful at it. But other people started another way, which means a little every day, consistency chapter in the morning, if that's what you can do, a chapter in the evening. And I said, well, you really uh, can do this because the object is not to just go learn. The object is to pull the learning, pull what's called makif, the thing that transcends you, that you like, that touches you, inspires you, into your own life. So it's part of your life. I mean, that's what we would like. Um, Sometimes you listen to a teacher and you come out of the class. Robert Jacobson tells the story very often and he says, and you say, well, that was a great class. And someone says, what was it about? And you go, well, uh, I don't know. It was a great class. It was something about soul, you know. Because what you're hearing is the teacher's knowledge, and it, but it does plug into a part of you that shows you you can relate to it. The question and the object is not for you to develop your teacher's knowledge, it's to take that or what you've learned and say, how is it relevant to me? And not only that, but if it's relevant to me, that's still not enough. How do I make that part of my life? So I have a little more clarity. The Torah comes from the word or, arisa, to draw light, to give direction. How do I get a little more light in my life? Because if something touches you, or something you relate to, it's probably always been there inside you. And someone, you go, aha. As it says in the Talmud and Nida, it says that before a child is born, an angel comes and teaches the child the entire Torah. And when it comes out, the angel smacks it on the lip, and that's why it cries, because it forgets it. It's not that it forgets it, it's that it has to work very hard to re-remember it. That's why when you hear something, you... Mostly you might go, aha, that sounds familiar to me. It's not like, it's a new concept. I didn't hear it put that way, but something inside 
uh, resonates with that. Now, of course, we know from different sonograms and stuff that there's no angel in there. So what does it mean? It means very basically that we are born with uh, a sense of what the truth is, a sense of what's uh, relevant to us and how the universe works. But then, after that, in order to make it part of us, we have to learn it again on a, in a momish way, uh, on our own. Because there's nothing that you can learn from someone else will be as powerful as what you learn working on your own. There's, there's two ways of getting a gift. One's called lamaila lamata, which means it's given from above. God blesses you with something. And then there's lamata lamaila, where you earn it. And in life, of course, there's a combination of both. And in the Jewish calendar, you'll see that there's a combination of both. In Passover, it says that uh, God took the Jewish people out of Egypt. We were on such a low level. We would hit rock bottom. So sometimes in our lives, we're in a situation, God forbid, where we hit rock bottom. There's no one who hasn't gone there. And all the better to mention that now, uh, because this is the three weeks, which I will explain, hopefully, with God's help. And uh, you can't see a way out. But something happens. A, a relationship that's been destroying you for years, all of a sudden has a better outcome, or you get out of it, you get rid of a job that you didn't have the courage to leave before or something. There's some big change, but it didn't really come from your concerted effort to say, I'm really going to change this now. It's up to me. I'm proactive. It came because something happened. That's the month of Nisan. Now, um, the converse of that is in the month of Tishrei, where we have all the holidays starting, where everything depends, so to speak, on our efforts. We have to pray. We do something called shuva, which means return to our real self. And if we're returning to ourself, it means we're returning to the part of us that has a sense of what truth and reality is, to the part of ourselves that uh, has been covered up by the 95% the of our lives that has to work to make money, take care of children, family, and all that gets covered up. But all you need is a little opening, and, and Hashem asks us in that time, well, I did my part, I took you out of Egypt, I made you free people, so to speak, and then now you have to do your part. Because there's two elements, as always. There's always drawing down from above and elevating from below. Abraham represents drawing down from above. It's called the right side. And Isaac dug wells. He elevates from below. So now, to get started, because this is a long topic in itself, we're in a, a period called the three weeks. But let's trace the history of it, because it's very interesting how the Jewish year lays out in general. The Jewish year in general is basically an emotional roller coaster. And anybody who's ridden it a number of times knows that. In other words, you know there's a different feeling on Passover than there is on uh, the three weeks, <laughs> thank God. And there's a different feeling on, on the high holidays, and there's a different feeling on Sukkot. All of these are emotions. Since the, the Torah is a blueprint and a guide to that part of us that is familiar with these concepts. And it has to take us through these periods. And we have to be able to learn to integrate them or to make them ours in some way on our level. See, it's not, it's not for us to say, I wish I could do what you did, except that's good if it encourages you to do more in your life. If you see someone who's really doing something, it's like in any business, you see someone who's really doing it, and you say, well, I can't do that, but I can do a little more. That's good. But you can say, what am I doing everything I can on my level? So the, on uh, the beginning of the Jewish calendar, which starts in Nisan, Hashem takes the Jewish people out of Egypt. Egypt meaning Mitzrayim, which uh, means Mitzrayim means straits and the places and the boundaries and the limitations of your life. Um, it means... Uh, where godliness is not revealed, which connects actually to the three weeks which come much later because they are called Bain Hametzarim, between the straits. 
right after that, we come out of Egypt and emotionally, okay, you get a breather from wherever we were in life. We're, we're out of that relationship. But we want to make sure we don't go back into the same relationship in a more refined form. Because we often do that. We keep doing the same patterns over and over again, a little trickier, a little better, because uh, we're very, very smart. And we can rationalize and we can give a very good excuse and a reason for everything we do. Believe me, we know why we do what we do. And that's why we hold where we hold. <clears throat> but for a moment, let's look at the, the uh, Torah's viewpoint. So we come out of Egypt and... Hashem tells us, um, starting on the second day of Pesach, count 50 days. It doesn't even give a date. Count 50 days until the giving of the Torah, because when Moses went to Pharaoh, as, as differentiated from the old song, let my people go, it's let my people go so they can serve me on the mountain. In other words, uh, to serve something greater in their lives, which is inside us as well. Otherwise, we wind up serving the lower parts of us, the, po the parts that take us emotional captive, our subjectivity, etc., etc. Now, you always have the option to go back to your emotional subjectivity, etc., but it's good to know the options. So we count the Omer, which is seven complete weeks. And as we've discussed in, during those times, those seven weeks are devoted to refining your emotions. So now that you're free of something, you can clarify, perhaps, the source of what got you into the trouble in the first place. Or at least change your makeup in some way so that you don't have to repeat the pattern on that level. Plus, to, cl to clarify your heart and purify your heart, because if you're going to receive from some, something, if you're going to receive love, which says the whole Torah in a way is love, if you're going to receive uh, a blueprint for life, if you're going to let another person in life give to you, if you're going to allow the universe in, you have to make yourself a vessel. You can't be completely full of who you always were and what you always did. As Rabbi Jacobson says, uh, if you do what you always did, say what you always said, you'll have what you always had. Maybe it'll be on a different level, but we have to make ourselves vessels. And one of the ways to make a, a person to be a vessel is to examine and scour their vessel themselves. Is to look at their situation. So there's seven weeks with the seven emotions that have been talked about, chesed, gabur, teferis, the way we love, the way we receive, the way we use discipline, our sense of compassion, our sense of ambition and endurance, our state of, uh, sense of uh, humility and gratefulness, uh, yusod, which is the sixth one, which is how we bond and how we bound ourselves to who we are. And of course, the seventh one is Malchus, which is empty, which means actually the vessel for the new you. And the wonderful thing about this, and an aside, is that uh, psychologically speaking, looking at your life in these ways helps you to pinpoint things that have been bothering your whole life, so you're not overwhelmed by saying, you know, this is not working. We know it's not working. Or maybe it could work better. So you can say, well, it's the way I love. I always expect something in return. Or I don't know how to fully give. Or I have too much discipline or not enough discipline. You can break it down to an element that you can deal with on one hand and work on that element. And since everything in the world is connected, as you work on that element, it, it helps every other element in you because we are all unified. Why are we all unified inside? Because we are a microcosm God's universe, where everything is one piece. So you can have Albert Einstein uh, making an axiom about the nature of black holes because he's saying, well, the universe is one piece. If I pull on the, the sheet here, it's going to wave out there somewhere. Everything is united. Um, so we refine our emotions, and then we receive the Torah, which is the third big section of the emotional roller coaster where we actually hear God's voice. I'm not going to clarify what that means. You can look in uh, many chapters on hearing God's voice and prophecy and stuff in Mori Nebuchim by the Rambam. But we hear, we see the picture of who we really are, what we're really here for, our purpose in life. It's as clear as day. It's as clear as the voice of God, which they actually heard. It said the voice, when the people heard it, had no echo. 
Now, what does that mean? What's an echo? An echo is something that bounces off something and, and comes out and reverberates. So it means that the whole universe absorbed that voice. So when we come to study, in order for us to integrate, we have to make ourselves into a vessel that can absorb that voice and then use it for, an, for our own nature. So we receive the blueprint. And we'll skip over right now. And then, of course, right after we receive the blueprint, 40 days later comes the 17th of Tammuz. As it says in the Gemara, it was the day that Moses came down from the mountain. And he broke the, the luchos because the people had made a golden calf. There's much to say about uh, that incident. And that's the beginning of so-called the three weeks. So the emotional roller coaster has taken us from a place of imprisonment to some kind of relief from the imprisonment to a state of uh, where you get to self-examine ourselves and that can be a painful thing and it can be a joyful thing and it's a growing thing so it's a good thing and then we receive a blueprint for life which says wow okay now I know how to do it it's like someone who's a, a musician you know I never could get the fingering right on this or I could never figure out how to do this business deal and someone says here's how you do it except you didn't do it yet. now you know this is, the, this is the handbook. There's a lot of things that a person has to leave behind in order to take on something new. So we receive the, the handbook. And this is basically the whole book of Shmos, the book of Exodus, is like this. It has three, three major parts. And after we receive the Torah, make the golden calf. And then Moses has to go back up on the mountain for a second and third 40-day period to fight with God to forgive us. Now you have to remember that the whole thing, so to speak, was rigged by God. Because we could always say, how could they do that? They just saw this, they saw all the miracles, they saw all the plagues, right? We all do it every day in our life. We all do the exact same thing. No matter what we learned yesterday and what we received yesterday, we act sometimes as though it never happened. Because we, the, the way we remember it is that we didn't integrate it so it's part of us yet. So Moses goes up and gains forgiveness for the people of uh, Israel. He comes down 40 days later. He makes other tablets that he had to carve himself. And uh, he comes down 40 days later after that, and it's Yom Kippur. God says, Salaki I have forgiven the people. So look at the emotional roller coaster we're on. The freedom, the refinement, the receiving of the blueprint, the really messing up. Imagine the relationship you always wanted with yourself, which will enable you to have the relationship you always wanted with others, which will enable you to have the relationship you always wanted with God. You had it. It says at that time that sickness was abolished. It says that people were not, death was abolished. I mean, what more could you ask for? And uh, something happened. How do we acknowledge this in life? Okay, so we, we're up to Yom Kippur. After Yom Kippur, there's four days uh, kind of a in between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. And it's a holiday of joy. So we start Nisan in, in, in the slavery to our, our, our boundaries and limitations. And we wind up with Sukkot, which is about total joy. Man Sim Chaseno, season of your joy. Dancing, eating in the sukkah, total faith in God, living outside. Now, the last holiday of the entire Jewish year is not in the Torah. The holidays are mostly are in the Torah. There's one holiday that's not in the Torah. Who knows what it is? Yeah. No, no, no. That's after. Purim is after. I'm talking during this time, right at the end of the holidays, the last holiday that we celebrate. Simchas Torah. Right? We have Shemini at Zeret, we have Sukkot, and then God says, stay one more day with us, because I love you. So I want to I I give you my closeness so you can bring that to other people. So you can bring it to the parts of yourself that hurt. But um, there's three kinds of ways to respond to someone you love. One of them is, if you, do, if you do what you command, what that person asks you. Your beloved asks you, would you mind? And you say, sure, I'd love to do that. 
The second way, which is a little stronger, is that someone you really care about hints at something. They don't really, they drop, there's a little hint, and you do it. It's another, a deeper level. The deepest level is when we lose our self-involvement to a point where we could say, what would the person I love want? What would they want? And we do it. So on the last day of all the Jewish holidays, we take the Torah and we dance with it. Now we started this class, class, forgive me, forgive me for saying that word, we started this discussion, this interchange between us, by saying, um, how do I integrate what I hear, what I learn, what I know to be true that's hard for me? And the Torah's answer, at the end of everything, it's a dance. It's a cosmic dance. At some point, the learning's got to be wrapped up, and you've got to grab it, and you've got to love it, drink a few l'chaims, and you've got to dance, because dancing draws light into your body. The purpose of learning is not to have it just in your head, and your emotions. It's so that your whole body responds, so that when you see someone who needs help, your hand automatically becomes chesed. It automatically reaches to help the person. Or when it feels something that's negative, it automatically takes a small step back and still is there. It's like, you want to call it instinct. Some people call it intelligence. But the thing about the Torah and the seven emotional attributes that we spoke about is that not only can you have better uh, emotional responses, that are, but you can be that thing. Abraham was not just practicing kindness. He was kindness. He became kindness. Moses was, uh, gave us the Torah. He was endurance. Joseph Hatzadik, Hatzadik Yisod Olam, he was the binding force. As you see, he's called the Tzadik. He's in the middle. Joseph, how did he bind us? When, we, when all the Jews came to Egypt, Joseph fed them, not only with food. He gave them the Mazonas for sure, but spiritually. We have to remember that before Joseph came to Egypt, all of the forefathers and brothers were shepherds. I mean, they were out in the, in the fields. They were sort of separated from society a little bit. They had to interact with their neighbors. But they weren't like uh, doing a nine-to-five gig. So here's Joseph gets thrown into slavery, winds up the, the, the vice chancellor of Egypt, and, and he's running a business. He's feeding people. He's apportioning. He's, he's, you know, he's not hedging. And uh, he's running a country. And then finally the brothers come down and the incident with them we know. And they tell Jacob. And um, Joseph sends a sign. You Forgive me for the shorthand, but there's a lot to cover. And Joseph sends uh, Jacob a sign that he's really alive. He sends him some wagons, agolos, to relate to the fact that the last thing they had studied 22 years ago was the Egla Rufa. A law about um, if, a, if a body is found dead. So Jacob says, this is unbelievable. My son, he's there. Something happened to him. I haven't seen him in 22 years. He's been separated. He's, wor he's working. He's the vice chancellor of Egypt. He's probably busy every day. You know, he's, got a, he's goes traveling all around the country, and he still retains his learning. He, he became that learning. You can become what you are and who you are so that it shows up even when you don't think about it. But how do we do that? We have to live through with the times. Now, the reason I mention the holidays in that way is because the holidays uh, go on for exactly 183 days. 183 is half the, the solar year. After that, there are no more uh, Torah holidays. There's some rabbinic holidays, but there's no Torah holidays. It's sort of like the Jewish yin and yang. You get all the energy for all of these periods by yourself. And then it says, uh, Yaakov, Holek, Hadarko, Jacob goes on his way, and, and I think it's Parshas Vayetze there. Now we're on our own. There's no more holidays in Mahishvan. There's no, there's no help from above. What did you do with what you had from the year? 
Of course, we're going to have Hanukkah coming up, which was added later by the rabbis, and so was Purim. But Hashem made it, so half of the year we're getting this kind of help. So anything that falls is right straight from above. Now it's up to us. That's why the winter is called the darkness. It's a time when there's, there's less visible light shining from above. Now within that spectrum of up and down emotions, there's this, this, the destruction of the tablets was on the 17th of Tammuz, and in later generations, the destruction of the first and second temples. The 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av. Actually, the 9th of Av was uh, in the Torah is when the spies came back on the 8th of Av and they said, we can't go into the land. And on the 9th day, everybody cried. And then Hashem made the decree that this generation would not go into the land. That's why we had to wander in the desert all those years. Because they said we can't do it. Because it had to do with their mission. God sends each of us and sent the spies. If you want to go, go. If you want to see how to do your mission, fine. Don't tell me if you can do it. Don't tell me if you can do the job I sent you in this life. With exactly what I, I gave you exactly what you need. I gave you the personality you need. I gave you the friends you need. I gave you everything you need. And that, on that day, it's sort of like a, a parent saying, you're crying for nothing now, I'll give you what to cry about. Because on the ninth of Av, many uh, unfortunate things happened. The destruction of the two temples, the expulsion from uh, Spain, World War I, many things, and many things befell the Jewish people. A time of, uh, a time of, uh, of pain and loss. So between the 17th of Tammuz and the ninth of Av is three weeks. So if all of these other holidays represent part of our emotional life, freedom, restriction, refinement, a joy at receiving the Torah, forgiveness. What do these three weeks represent? What do we need to be complete people? Through the parameters of what we've uh, done, we've seen that we end up with joy. So joy is part of our life. It says, Eve do es Hashem b'simcha, serve God with joy. And we'll talk about that a little bit. We find that we all are, have our restrictions in life and things that seem to be hemming us in. We find that we have the emotional and intellectual ability to examine who we are. We find that there are ups and downs. We find that there are times of forgiveness and times of great joy. And there are times that we're so plugged in that we even know what the universe wants, what God wants. And in that time, we do the cosmic dance. Well, the cosmic dance is advance and retreat, forward and back. What we're missing here is what do we do about the losses in our life? What do we do with the sad parts of our life? Do we sweep them under the, 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 under the rug? Do we just get through them and just soldier by, which we have to do at certain times? It's very hard to deal, of course, with uh, someone's passing, etc., and that's discussed in Parshish Hukat. And I refer you to the rabbi's uh, last class on that, where it's a purification from death. But we all have losses. We all have mourning to do for things that didn't go our way. Dreams we've lost. Hopes we've had. Friends that didn't work out. Relationships that didn't work out. And when do we ever really get a time to sit with ourselves and have a real conversation about those losses in our life? When do we ever really get to see what the nugget of truth beyond, below the surface is? Usually we're so busy we never do. We get some advice with our friends. We have a couple of beers. <coughs> uh, now with, uh, with death, <coughs> God gave us some laws. The laws of the first three days after the passing, the laws of Shiva, the laws of uh, Shloshim, and the uh, year, so 11 months of Kaddish. And then he says, move on. As the Medrash says about Moses didn't understand this. God explained it to him. You have to move on because otherwise we'd mourn our whole lives. We have many other losses. <coughs> Excuse me. In daily losses, daily disappointments that come up as well. The three weeks is an opportunity 
for us to have that as our main theme, to address the losses and the sorrows in our life. Not to bring ourselves down, but to have the conversation about them that we always wanted to. Well, I'm not sure you'll tell me if it was Jung or Freud who said this, that uh, neurosis is a substitute for not feeling suffering. One of the psychiatrists, famous. In other words, it's, if, you don't let it, if you don't express it or integrate it somehow, it's going to come out sideways in your relationships. One year, um, I took a look at all my songs, and I said, oh, my gosh, every one of my songs, even the ones on Sesame Street, has a sense of loss in it, every single one. But through many, many years of, uh, of working on it, I was able to integrate it, I even get a bunch of humor out of it, because uh, through, through, through much hard work. So what do we do? We have three weeks. Hashem says, better you should take three weeks and devote it to the, that period of your life that did not work out. Those things you still long for. The temple inside you that you built that got burned. And what made it happen? Better you should have that conversation. We need this time to integrate on a very, very uh, personal level the low points of our life. Otherwise, they're never expressed. And who's to say that they don't express as much love as the revealed types of life? As, as an example, in the Talmud, Reb Shimon Bar Yochai sends his son, Reb Elazar, to get a bracha from two uh, rabbis. And he goes and he gets his bracha, and the bracha is like, feels like all oh, devastation and ruin and everything. He comes back and he tells his father, Father says, he retranslates it for him. He says, there was something that you had to pay off in life. And they couldn't give you the good until they cracked it through a little, with a little humility. And they gave you such an intense goodness that it couldn't be revealed in a normal way. If Hashem is all good, how come things come down in a different form? There's an ankalos, there's a targum, targumic... Uh, translation of the word, one of the words that represents not good as substitute. Sometimes when you're supposed to be receiving good and your vessel can't handle it, it comes down as something that seems negative. Which is a sign to you. It's the universe speaking to you. It's God speaking to you. It's like, clarify this vessel so it can come in, in, a, in a good way. Why do you want to learn this through suffering? I'm not talking about things that seemingly come from the outside. So sometimes uh, some matters of suffering or pain contain an even greater good. It's not that we're going to be jumping for joy when these things happen, but the object of life, it never says in the Torah, uh, it says, Ibn Duas Hashem Basimcha, serve God with joy, but um, Rashi in a certain commentary says, Simcha, joy, also means wholeheartedness. In other words, how can you be joyful when someone is sick? How can you be joyful when things aren't going a certain way? God forbid the children, this, that, and the other thing. So there's a book by Rabbi uh, Avram Tversky called Let Us Make Man where he discusses this concept. And Rashi's saying, serve God with wholeheartedness. That whatever comes your way, you've integrated something on your level that even though you're in suffering, you understand that something else is also going on. Something greater than you. And you cannot do that Really, unless you accept upon yourself the mission of your life. Someone who walks around without any purpose in life is going to be crushed by everything. It's not like you, I'm not, not uh, suggesting that we sit down and say, gee, I'm so glad I was sick. It's not like that. Um, unfortunately, I have some medical problems. and I was in the hospital once, and uh, Rab Rabbi Jacobson, he called me, and I thought he was going to say, get better soon. And he said, do what you came there to do and go home. In other words, God sends you where you need to be. God forbid a, per a person is sick and he goes to the hospital, that's where he needs to be. It's not a good place to be, but if you're sick. So how do we uncover the hidden meaning in suffering instead of avoiding it and turning it against ourselves? Because what usually happens us with anger is that we turn it against ourselves if we don't express it. Now, it doesn't mean that you can go around yelling at people all the time. It's not it. 
but it means dealing with it on some level where you get to express it. And it's also very important in what's called the spiritual community because you can have people doing uh, weird things in the name of Torah. And it's not Torah. They're using the Torah as a club to hit someone for their personality. And you've seen, and we see this, unfortunately. And you have to understand that this is not the Torah. So God gives us the three weeks. And in these three weeks, we take the roller coaster down. It's a time to really examine the things that have been getting at you for a long time. Just remember that, as the Rebbe said, a descent for the purpose of an ascent is no descent at all. In other words, if you're on a roller coaster to get the speed to go to the next hill, you have to come down as fast as you can. You can't just go like this. You don't, there's no velocity there. The velocity is, is going down, riding the times, being able to say this is part of my mission too. There's an inter interesting interpretation, and in, I think in the Musar, when uh, Moses sees the burning bush, the voice of Hashem says to him, take off your shoes because the place you're standing on is holy. Okay, on a shot level, on a regular literal level, we can understand that. There's a presence there. But the Musar interprets it as whatever place you're standing on is holy. If it's a, what you would call a good place, what you would call a painful place, whatever place you're in, that place at the moment is holy. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try to get out of something negative. But only by accepting who we are and what we feel can we reach wholeness. The topic of tonight is wholeness, heartbreak, and happiness. I, I, maybe I should have called it wholeness, uh, heartbreak, and hope. Because as Jews, we never lose hope. But hope is not just a, an ephemeral thing. Hope is that you keep moving in a, in a, uh, in a positive way. When Moses was up uh, arguing with Hashem to forgive the Jewish people after the sin of the golden calf, it says, uh, God started a conversation with Moses by saying, uh, don't talk to me. But Moses wasn't trying to. But he pleads for forgiveness. And God says, look, I made the universe that if you stick your hand in fire, you burn. Don't blame me. I said, don't worship idols. You're worshiping idols. There's nothing I can do with it. The system is like that. And it, it's, you know, meter connected meter. It's measure for measure. I, what do you want from me? Don't put your hand in the fire. So Moses says to him, yeah, but you're beyond the system. You created the system. He tells God, you can reach deeper, Kav Yochel, inside yourself and give us mercy. That even when the law says it should burn, it doesn't burn. And that's what Moses went up there to, and was hawking Nishkin Chinik with Hashem all that time. And what does he come down with? He comes down with the 13 attributes of mercy. But they had to be argued for. They had to be fought for. So he wasn't going to come down without hope. And what is hope? Hope means that no matter how far or what we've done, we can always return to our true inner self, the essence, the intrinsic essence that our soul, which is part of God above, as it says in Tanya, is and is connected to. So, tshuva, which is a return to that, was fought for hard by Moshe. So when a person is in the three weeks, they've got a number of tools to use for the things that we could have done better, we can return. How do we know we can return? It seems like sometimes you say, you know, I'm so far away from anything godly. I've done such things in my life. I'm not getting back. There's no way God will take me back. For this, we have to go to the Dordea, the generation of knowledge. When we read the book of Bamidbar, which is about after getting all the resources you need to live a, a holy life, being thrust out into the wilderness, what's the first thing we find is that the spies don't want to go into the land. People are complaining against God. Korach is causing all kinds of confusion. Moses hits the rock. 
Bilam comes to curse the Jews. A negative voice shows up. After the negative voice shows up, the, the people uh, get involved in, in sexual promiscuity. Pinchas, the overly zealous zealot, stops the plague. I mean, it's like a crazy story. It doesn't seem very linear. But why was it given to this generation, which is called the Dor Dea? The, the generation of knowledge committed all, did all these things. They weren't like regular people, maybe we did, like me or many others who didn't grow up with anything. They heard God's voice in Mount Sinai. No, their fathers did. They felt God's presence in, in the wilderness. They had Moses, the leader. I mean, this is the top of the line. How could they do that? And aside from that, they made the golden calf. How could they do that? This is the... You've got to... Be... Did you ever ask yourself that question? With everything I know, how did I do that? Nobody ever did? Just me? <laughs> Say to say, all of that was orchestrated by Hashem to give everybody who would come after in all history an opening to do tshuva, an opening to return, an opening to forgive others, to forgive themselves, and to even forgive God. In other words, there's no, there's no you can't be so far away that you can't come back to a place. That's hope. Knowing that. But how do we integrate that? You've got to do something. The mitzvahs, which mean connections from Tzavz of Echibor, connections and, and, uh, and, and pulling everything back together, come to help us reestablish what we've lost. Say you have, God forbid, there's a person in the family, you know you haven't spoken in 15 years. Someone's got to, if someone makes the first move, maybe something will happen. I've seen this a number of times where pro people are mad at each other. If someone doesn't give up hope, maybe there's a chance. Hashem never gives up hope on us. As he says in the prophets, where's your bill of divorce? I never divorced you. He says, uh, I have to hide my face once in a while. In other words, I have to take away my presence. I have to see what you're going to do on your own now. Did you integrate all of this stuff, or are you just going to yeshiva all day and learning and then acting like someone else? What, also, what's a yeshiva? It doesn't just mean uh, shave, to sit. Yeshiva means to integrate, right? You integrate, pull it in, it becomes part of you. What are midos? Our emotions are called midos, measures. Become part of you. You have the power through examining and riding the roller coaster of life and going through the three weeks and exploring your losses, the down parts, but not to so much that you get depressed because depression is, is really not good. It says in the Tanya there's two kinds of sadness, what's called atzvus and what's called marirus. Atzvus is a sadness. If something makes you depressed because you did it, that's worse than what you did. You keep beating yourself up for the rest of your life for something you did. It says in the Tanya that every day a person should take a little time out to meditate on Hashem and to see where he's so-called sinned or disconnected. And he should cry about it. Right? Every day. Except right after that, he should know he's forgiven. And he's a tzaddik again. In other words, uh, the purpose of Mariro's bitterness, which is, I'm not living up to who I am. It's the cosmic anxiety. That's what Yiras Hashem is about in a way, too. It's not fear that you're going to be struck down. That's the lowest level. It's the fear that maybe I'm not living up to my expectations. And I, the, that, that uh, God is a brutal father, and if you don't do it, you're going to get slapped. I mean, that, you know, we all know we have talents and stuff, and we all know we're blowing it a little bit here and there. But that never brings satisfaction. So there's like a cosmic anxiety. Anxiety isn't necessarily bad either. Anxiety tells you there's something moving in you that needs to be fixed. Anxiety is, a, is, is one of the voices of the soul, just like tears. If we have an anxiety that we're not living up to who we are, and I'm not saying that we should go get so crazy that every day we're disconcerted with ourselves, just have a basic feeling, then of course we discuss it with people with trust. It says, Asay uh, Rav. Get yourself a rav, or make yourself a rav, a kani and acquire a friend. You have to have people you trust in life. 
You can't have people who are doing the same stuff as you are and expect to get a real good answer. You get, if you're looking for mirrors, there's one at home. So the three weeks again carries incredible treasure because tears cleanse the soul. I'm not talking about crying. Sometimes we cry and we don't know why, and that's the soul talking to us. But sometimes there's something in actually in your life that you could cry about. Maybe you're sorry about something, or you're still hurt that you never expressed it. True tears, for the purpose of growth, bathe the soul. Now, it's funny, because tears are salty. They don't quench any thirst, really. But when a person cries from the heart, because he senses his distance from himself, from other people, and from Hashem, which, which is uh, the same thing as the destruction of the temple. Today, we read about the destruction of the temple because we're acknowledging that at that time, at those times, with the first and second base, I mean, that there was a closeness to Hashem that we, we don't have right now. There was a closeness to who we really are. There was a closeness to our ability to connect with other people. So what do we do? We study this period. And one of the things we study is the, is the Rambam's Hilchos Beis HaBechira, the building of the temple. It says those who study about the building of the temple, it's as if they rebuilt it. And those who are not building in your generation are as though you're destroying it. Look, you have two choices in your life. To be a builder or, you know, as Dylan, Bob Dylan says, those not being busy, busy being born or busy dying, if you're not building something in your life, if you're not working towards your mission, if you're not bringing a little light in your own way to the best of your ability, no one is asking you to do it more than you can. As Rabbi Zusha said when he, he gets up to heaven, I'm not afraid that they're going to ask me uh, that I, why I wasn't like Moses. They're going to say, why weren't you like Zusha? And just knowing that this is part of the roller coaster ride. Now it says, Shemin uh, Niknas Av, Mamatim Basimko, when Av comes, when this period comes and before we lessen our joy. Now the Hasidim retranslate this. When Av comes, we joyfully do things that lessen the sadness. In other words, so during this, these periods, you'll see a lot of people having suudas, things where they celebrate the end of a uh, tractate or certain uh, different festival things. Because joy and wholeness heartbreak and happiness are all part of the same thing. It's part of the panorama of life. And a full person, I think anyone we know, is someone who's had all of these things happen in their life. We're always amazed by stories in, uh, you know, sort of People magazine or wherever about someone who's overcome a great, a great obstacle and moved on. Christopher Reeves, who was paralyzed, as you know, passed away. He once said in an article something that very moved me very much. I have no patience for people who just kind of paralyze themselves with their, with their stuff. I have no patience. Now, coming from him, who could not move, could not do anything, and what did he do? He built a foundation. He set up things to help other people. And there are many people like that. I just unfortunately lost a friend, Sprobas Edel Shishnev, at least, Neshama who had many, many illnesses and stuff, and every day she was on the phone helping someone else. She was a builder. She was building. She was like, like the guys in, uh, on Pesach Sheni, where there were a couple of people who were far away doing the Pesach offering, and they come complaining to Moses, hey, we missed the Passover offering. We don't, we're not willing to give that up. I don't want to miss up the connection. Yeah, I missed you last time you were in town. I, I want to see you this time, you know? They said, Loma Nagora. Why should we miss out on our connection just because we've been doing something that's not... How many of us say Loma Nagora? Why should I miss out on the connections in my life? Mostly we say, ah, oh, I blew that one, maybe next time. Right? Okay, it's over, that's done. But that's not what the Torah teaches. The Torah teaches there's a sense of wholeness in life. It never once in the Torah says things are easy. It doesn't even try to prove God's existence. The only thing it says in the Psalms is the Ta'amu Ruki Tov Hashem. Taste it and try it. So the Torah, as a light, says, let me shine, let, let the Torah shine the light. 
Let me give you some options here. One, let's find direction. So as we go through the Jewish year, you'll find so much direction what to do when you're trapped by your boundaries and limitations. First, to know about them. Second, to find ways to get free. Third, to change yourself. Fourth, and then you become another person, you can, and you're another vessel. But one of the interesting things is, the Lubavitch Rebbe says something very uh, interesting. He says, maybe we could forgive the, sky, the, the spies a little bit and some of these people. After all, they were the first generation in the history of the world asked to live out the true paradox of life. In other words, to go through their materialistic life with their eyes on heaven and also to have a sense of self, of, who, of Yeshus, who you are, but to abrogate that to God. Now, it's not such an easy thing, is it? So he says, maybe we could be a little kinder towards them. And that's why we have to be kinder towards ourselves when we make certain mistakes, because we've never tried to live the paradox. We're not trying to get out of the paradox. This isn't one of those stories that the happy ending is everything is solved and no one was this and that. The paradox of life is that life itself is a wholeness, one whole unity. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echod, God is one. There is nothing else. Enod Milvado. Everything that we see here is a lesson for us in our service of God and also how to unify our personalities so that we don't have two different parts. One that goes to shul on Shabbos and the other one that's uh, doing something not so good on the other days. How do I integrate it? I'm not, t I'm not telling anybody to stop what they're doing. But, you know, everybody's doing what they're doing, but how do we integrate it so we don't feel fractured? Well, it's very interesting that the whole first part of the Torah which takes up like about 2,500 years, the book of uh, Breshis and the book of Shmos, first two books, are filled with all the linear events from the beginning of creation uh, through the generations of Noah, ten generations later of uh, Abraham, seven generations later to Moses, Jacob, the 12 children. You can read them in a semi-linear way. I'm not talking about the specific pasukim that people, some people say are out of water. Some people say there's no water. Ramban and uh, Rashi have a discussion there. If they're linear events. Jews came, went to Egypt. They were enslaved. Moses came and with God's help took them out. We went, the, Red sea, the Reed Sea was split. The Torah was given. They made a mistake. It's all linear, right? It's like a narrative that linear. You don't go, well, this is out of place. You may say that's incredible, but it's very linear. Then they build a mishkan, a home for God, because the end of life is not to have a blueprint for what we're talking about to here, to build a temple for Hashem. It says in Truma, you build a home for, for something greater than yourself, Hashem. And he will dwell in it. You will dwell in yourself in a way that you don't live inside yourself now. You will be with yourself in a way you are not now. Because the temple's been destroyed, our connection. We will be with others in that way. Then, starting in the third book, the whole rest of the Torah is 40 years. No? No? The book of Vayikris, I think, is under a month. Then, um, the book of uh, Bamidbar, which we're in now, which is called travels in the desert. In other words, now we're in the spiritual desert. The whole linear first part up to the book of uh, the third book, Leviticus, gives us all the tools we need, all the, the holiness we need to live a life that, of wholeness. And then we get to the third book, which is represented by the neshama, actually, the, all the uh, karbanos, which means to draw near God, is half in this world and half in the world above. It's how to connect to the part of you that's transcendent. So now we have all this information and all of this stuff. All of a sudden, we go out into a spiritual desert, and all kinds of crazy things start happening. People don't want to go into the land. In other words, they don't want to complete their mission. People are complaining. Some people are saying it's too holy. Some people are saying we're all holy. We don't need leaders. What is this? It doesn't seem like it's linear anymore. It seems like it's fragmented. 
Because once you reach a certain level in life, you have to be able to take the things that seem like fragments, that seem like haphazard, and understand that they are part of the unity of God and they are part of the road that you need to travel to get into the land, to do your mission. Because the ground on which you are standing is holy. Part of that is going to include the moments in life that don't feel so good. So the Torah so wisely says, for three weeks, we're going to examine that. And you know what? Most people say, I wish that wouldn't have happened to me, but I wouldn't have been the same person I am if that didn't go on in my life. I wouldn't wish it on anyone else. Because they're, like when Moses comes to uh, Paro, and Paro makes things worse. Makes things worse. Now you have to go out and collect straw by yourself, he says. And the people hock, Moses, what, what, you came here to help us, and now things are worse. And then the people cry out to God. In other words, they hadn't hit rock bottom. They hadn't done the work of the three weeks. They were in the suffering, but somehow there was, a, there, was an, there was something going on there. They had to hit the point where they say, we can't stand it anymore. We want out. And God says, I heard they're crying. And it says in the Torah, God says, now you'll see what I'm going to do. In other words, sometimes unless you break open yourself, the ego, the sense of yourself that's negative, that's holding you back, you can't, as Leonard Cohen says, everything is broken and in the place of the broken stuff, the light comes in. We think back on our lives, certain relationships we lost and how we had much better ones later. We think about jobs we lost. I think Muhammad Ali once said, you're not really a fighter until you've lost a, a bout. Or uh, if you're not really a playwright uh, until you've had a flop. Because you learn more from sometimes from your failures. But if you're on a mission, you're learning. If you're a baseball player, your mission is to win the game. So if you struck out three times, you still, got it, you still say... Game's not over. You're not going to be depressed. And you get up and you hit a home run in the ninth. You know? They say Babe Ruth originally was the home run king, but he was a strikeout king. Well, as Wayne Gretzky says, you always miss all the shots you don't take. You miss 100% of them. So we're taking risks in life. We're saying, at some point, I want to take the learning that I've learned, the vibe that I see from other people, and I want to make a part of mine. So I want to try something. Let me try something different. If whenever I'm in this uh, argument with someone, the same thing happens, let me try something else. Let me keep my mouth shut for once in a while. Let me do something different. Because doing something different on any level is the most difficult thing. Because you're breaking a habit. Because most of us act instinctively off our emotions. So Rabbi uh, Yitzhak Ginsburg, he says, when giving advice, don't say the first thing that comes into your mind. Because that's coming from you, about you. And that's why, and also, you can relate that, it says the world was created by Hibara, with the letter He. Now what's the letter He? A line this way, a, a line that way, and a line on this side with a space. Now the Kabbalists teach us that, that the, 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 end, the, the letters of the, of the Hebrew alphabet, which are the building blocks of creation, are energy forms. The top is always Machshava, Deber, and this is Misa, thought, speech, and action. Remember that thought and speech are more connected to the soul, in a way, than action. Take a space before you act. In other words, if you're going to react immediately, take that space. It's the difference between kindness and compassion. What does the situation need? I know my tendency is to always try to make things better. You know, a person may feel that way, or a tendency might just say everything's for cocktail. But if I really believe that, how do I say it in the most constructive way based on who's standing in front of me? You give a child what it needs to learn. You know, a mother runs out in the street and says, don't play in the traffic, I told her. <laughs> you know, the kid almost got hit by a car, God forbid. Yeah, the kid's frightened already. And she's only acting out her own anger, you know, which is, uh, we're a father. Uh, and we're, we're constantly doing that. We're constantly acting off who we are without thinking about it. The Torah, if it can give you anything, it's a tiny space. A space to say, where am I? What's going on here? A bit of a distance. A bit of distance that allows you to react quickly when it's necessary.
There are not times to think about anything. When people are in danger, you have to act quickly. But you can't start practicing in that moment. Like they say, don't buy a fire extinguisher after the fire started. So what we're learning now are the tools to integrate. Now, how do we integrate them? Following through the year of the Jewish holidays, on Passover, we do something physical. We eat matzah, physical matzah, because it represents humility. We drink and sanctify wine, which represent different things. We don't have any real mitzvahs for uh, Shavuos, except eating cheese blintzes. But, uh, you know, a Hanukkah, you have latkes because of the oil. In other words, there's always a physicalization. And you'll see this in the prophets. When Elisha comes to the woman who's uh, got to raise money, he says, what do you have in the house? She's got a little bit of oil. So, okay, bring the little bit of oil. From that, you can make a bracha. A bracha will rest on what you have. And because Hashem put us each here with a special mission and a purpose, we each have that little something to make the bracha over to grow into what we need in life. Sometimes that takes mourning. Sometimes it takes a period of sorrow. It's not a 24-hour-a-day thing, but it's an acknowledgement that who I am comprises a number of different things that all combine to make me a whole person. As they say, someone who's never experienced real joy can never experience pain. And someone who's never experienced suffering will never experience true joy. And how is this integrated into Judaism? Well, we break the glass at the wedding. Right? We don't forget. In the moment of joy, don't forget that life has a lot of things. Or you build a new house. It's supposed to leave one L, which is about 20 inches of unpainted, in memory of the base Hamigdash. I mean, what are we mourning, this Beis Hamigdash? It's, you know, it's 2,000 years already. Shiva's last seven days. Hadash is a year, you know, a year. We're mourning this. Because what are we mourning? We're mourning the connection to something deeper and greater that's not so easy for us to reach now. The quality of our lives, we're not seamless. We're trying to get back to being seamless. In other words, in the Beis Hamigdash, who you are and what you do were one thing. It's a quality of seamlessness. How many of us live fragmented lives where who we are is one thing because of what we have to work and the deal and this is the way everybody does business and what we are is, is in our eyes is much more elevated. So we're trying to pull together these fragments. So the first part of the Torah gives us a linear story with tools and the second part shows us it's, that it might feel fragmented but that, that everything that happens is part of the same unity because the point is to go into the land. God gave us the land, it's, which is a, a Lashen Ratzon, which is a will, which is your mission. And by accepting a mission, someone can deal with suffering in a different way because it's part of a greater plan and you're connected to something greater. And this is how we grab the treasures that are in that suffering. We don't say, as I mentioned before, I'm glad that happened to me. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about accepting the wholeness of life. There's a really bit, a sad story, actually. Many years ago, uh, a Jewish soldier was captured. And um, the IDF found out where he was. And, you know, the mother was praying all the time, God will help, God will help. And... Uh, they burst in on the attackers and they shot the prisoner. So a very irreverent reporter went to the mother and said, huh, what happened? You've been asking God all this time. What happened now? Where's your God? And she looked at him, perfect amun in faith, and she said, yeah, God said no. In other words, I'm still in the relationship. It's a painful no relationship with children is 100% one way or another. No relationship with a person you're married to over many years. It's in, there's ups and downs. But we're still in the relationship. The base Hamigdash was, you could feel it every minute that you're in the relationship. We live in, the, in a, a kind of a world of darkness where we don't see the connections. So I hope that people will come away from tonight and with their own studies and, and take one small item from the suffering of their past and have a conversation with yourselves. Forgive yourself 
forgive others, forgive God, cry, let the tears bathe you. Try to find a way to the wholeness. Because when a person allows himself to feel the full gamut of emotions, then there's nothing that has to be hidden inside. Now, a person also has the choice not to express everything all the time. But this three-week period is a time that's very conducive. Because, as we said, at the end of this period, which is the ninth of Na Av, there follows a day called the 15th of Av, Tuba Av. And the Talmud says there were no two more joyous days in the calendar than Tuba Av and Yom Kippur. And in those days, all the young maidens would dance around and the guys would come out and kind of <laughs> see everybody. The full moon of the month of Av, which is the most devastating month, is the greatest of the full moons. Because the full moon reveals the true energy of every month in fullness. And after you've hit the bottom, the full moon of Av reveals that there was some hidden good underneath it. And it's the most powerful full moon. So um, I give everybody a bracha that we should take advantage of these times and, and not uh, dwell in sadness, but to use them to your own advantage into learning how to integrate any kind of learning by actually doing things. And if people ha are looking for techniques and stuff, they can uh, in, uh, contact us at uh, Meaningful Life Center. I'm Philip at MeaningfulLife.com and, or the rabbi, I'm sure, we'd be glad to... Uh, you maybe give some uh, suggestions on how to integrate what we learn. Instead, in other words, instead of coming away from our learning and then going back to the world as the same person, coming back, coming in back to the world as a person who holds it. Like we say on Shabbos, why is Shabbos one day of the week? If Shabbos is so great, make it seven days of the week. On Shabbos, you take everything you are and you bring it into the world. Or you wait the whole week for Shabbos. But it's Shabbos, Dicker. That's why well, the, the call box always say, good Shabbos, whatever day of the week it is. Good job, is. There's something inside you. Take the good. Bring it into every situation. and Let that help you move ahead. So I uh, wish everybody... Uh, I thank you all for coming and for giving me this uh, privilege. I want to say uh, uh, healing for Rose Koken on her operation. And Leith Ferret, Mira Fagel, Leich Lamerl Bas Yehudis, Yosef Benesta, Moshe Chaim Ben Chana, and all the sick of the people of Israel... May God bring us together in unity. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. We have a